The following interview was conducted with Gilbert T. Satterley, Jr., Professor Emeritus of Transportation Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, May 27, 2010, in Stewart Center, 263. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Dr. Satterley. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Let's start. Tell us where and when you were born and your parents okay. in early I was years. Born in 1929 in Detroit, Michigan. Okay. Uh, my father was born in southern Illinois on a farm and he dropped out of high school at the end of the 10th grade and uh, I'm not sure when he moved to Detroit but uh, early in his uh, life he moved to Detroit and got a job in the automobile plants and he was a production worker and my mother was born and raised in Detroit uh, she finished high school and I think she may have done one semester at uh, Detroit City Colleges which is right in the Detroit area and then she dropped out. And, uh, Any brothers or sisters? Uh, yes I have mm -hmm. uh, two brothers and a uh, half sister. Uh, I'm the oldest and then I have a brother who's now deceased and uh, and then a younger brother who just recently retired and uh, my half sister lives up in the Detroit area. Okay. My uh, second brother lives in Florida. Okay. Um, what was grade school like and then taught so uh, high school? Went to a uh, grade school in the center city of Detroit and uh, did fairly well and uh, then uh, the high school I went to was ninth through twelfth grade uh, McKenzie High School. Uh, I understand some famous football player that played for the Pittsburgh Steelers graduated from the <laughs> same high school. But uh, it, whoever, right? <laughs> but I don't remember his name now, and that was long after I graduated. Sure. But, uh, did nine through twelve. Uh, see, I started uh, high school in '43, I think it was. Yeah, because I graduated in high school in 1947. Okay. Uh, did well in high school. It was what was high school like? It was during the war then. What was it like? Yeah. Or, or um, was they well, we had rationing, you know, sure. gasoline and sugar and meat and all this other stuff. And uh, Did your father, was he still with the company? Did it change? Were they making other things other than automobiles? Yeah, well, he, oh. he, he worked at Dodge, Maine for years as a production grinder, mm -hmm. uh, what they call it outside dimension or OD grinder. And then during the war, he transitioned into uh, grinding on tools. So he was making tools for uh, these small tool and die shops. Sure. He uh, worked in these shops during World War II. Now he was born in 01, so he missed World War I. And then he was too old for World War II, so he didn't have to go to either one. Uh, when I was in high school in ninth grade, uh, they had a large ROTC program, infantry, army ROTC program. In high school? Mm hmm And uh, a large program. And all the high schools in Detroit had uh, at least a company, maybe a battalion. You know, Did several you have companies. to take it? Yeah, it was voluntary. Oh, okay. And, uh, by the time I graduated, uh, I was the city commander. I was the top-ranking cadet in all of Detroit in the ROTC. And uh, I would have liked to have gone to West Point. And I could have easily gotten a, an appointment to West Point, but my eyes were not good. So I couldn't pass the physical, so I didn't go to West Point. But I um, took college prep course, and I took, uh, in addition to the regular college prep course, I took four years of mechanical drawing, and three and a half years of ROTC, and I graduated second in the class. Uh, there must have been 600 in the graduating oh, class. Very nice, very nice. And, uh, Any stu clubs that you joined, that you belonged to there when you were there in high school? Oh, yeah. Did ROTC take up quite a bit well, of Well, ROTC, yeah. and then uh, I was in the science club, and uh, the uh, ushering club. And, For events and uh, things. Worked in the library. As a volunteer, <laughs> shelving books. We are uh, always needed. Right, back then anyway. Yeah. And uh, 
don't know what else I was in, but... Um, was school far from, from home for you? Uh, we were right at the edge of the school district, and it was probably two or three miles. Oh, okay. Take a bus or I'd walk, sure. good weather. Okay. Uh, then after graduation, what... And well, when I graduated, uh, the Wayne University, which is in Center City, Detroit, it was controlled by the and operated by the Board of Education of the City of Detroit. And is that uh, still the case? No. Oh, okay. uh, and each year they would award two scholarships to each high school, and so you're. If you were one of the top graduates, you'd be eligible for it. Well, so I got a full scholarship to Wayne University. And I'd say my family didn't have much money. So there was no question that I'd be going to the sure. live at home, go to the school. I always used to say I uh, went away to school. I took a bus every morning <laughs> to uh, go to school. But um, <laughs> so I started Wayne in fall of '47, and completed the first year. And when my mother divorced my father, after I completed my first year in college, and the house was sold, and then my mother lived with my grandmother and grandfather for a little while, took my uh, two younger brothers with her, and. I moved into, uh, well, that summer I worked in the Ford Motor Company and on the assembly line, working afternoons. That was pretty good money then. Oh, yeah. And uh, so I saved enough money that I could move into a, uh, Wayne just had opened their first dormitory. They took so it must have been primarily city commuter students before right. that, no residents at all. No. Okay. And what they did was they purchased an old... Uh, apartment hotel on the camp, right next to the campus, Hotel Webster Hall, and uh, they bought that and converted it into uh, student housing, and I moved in there and stayed one semester. And then my mother bought a house uh, about four doors down from my grandmother's house, and uh, so I moved, well, that works. so I just moved back yeah. home, because <laughs> sure. I'd run out of money. Yeah. Was your scholarship good only for one year, or was it no, renewable? No, it was renewable, oh, okay. as long as I kept my grades up. And good. So I had a scholarship for the full, uh, actually, it took me four and a half to fill. Sure. But I, took, I was on a five-year plan. Uh, the fifth year, I only needed four courses more. So I took two courses each, two courses in the fall, two courses in the spring. And then I worked 20 hours a week for a consulting engineering company in downtown Detroit. What was your, was your major engineering? Was it civil engineering? Civil engineering. Oh, okay. I started off mechanical engineering and then decided I didn't like thermodynamics. I did well in it, but didn't like it. And uh, all mechanical engineers were required to take a surveying course. So I took the surveying course. I thought, oh, that's kind of fun. So I switched to civil engineering. Sure, good. <laughs> and uh, finished then. And, civil engineering, uh -huh. and uh, the, during the summers while I was in college, that first summer I worked for Fords, the following summer I worked for Dodges in Dodge, Maine on the assembly line, and the summer after that I worked for Chevrolet, Gear and Axle, and then the following summer I got a job in a consulting engineering company in downtown Detroit, and then I worked uh, that summer, and then the following year was that fifth year, and I worked 20 hours a week for the consulting engineering company. Well, it worked out nicely for you. Yeah, good experience. Good experience, Looked right. good on the resume. Right, and yeah. the money was good, too. So That's right. And then while I was in college, uh, uh, the, let's see, the first, the third semester, I took the, the first uh, engineering physics course and did well. And the professor asked me to stay on as his grader. So then for the rest of my career at Wayne, I graded uh, general engineering physics homework. That's nice. 
it's, I'd spend the weekend grading the whole class's uh, homework papers and then would uh, have office hours to help the students sure. if they had any questions with how I <laughs> graded their problems. So that's why I swore that's my way through school. You know. <laughs> I did, did well in college. Um, graduated first in the civil engineering class. 3.67, I think, which in those days was a pretty good grade point. Mm. Don't have many 4.0s then. <laughs> Not in engineering. <laughs> and, uh, How large was the, in uh, civil, was it a pretty good sized class? Uh, mm. Well, we probably had 30 graduate. Mm. It wasn't the Engineering real. overall was not that large? Not, not real large, okay. not like Purdue. Sure. Okay. They still have engineering in the uh, Yes. In fact, uh, I taught at Wayne two different times. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. what was the next, next thing after you got finished? Okay, well... In 1949, while I was in school, they reinstituted the draft. And they also uh, started a program whereby college students could take an exam. And if you did well on the exam, you could get a deferment from induction if you were drafted. So I was in that first group that took those exams that the Selective Service uh, administered. And then, that was 1949, shortly thereafter I got a letter from the Selective Service Board that says, greetings, a group of your friends and neighbors have selected you. So I was drafted. And, <laughs> but. Truman is calling. <laughs> and. At the same time I was drafted. But you had you finished? Oh, oh no, this was in 49. Oh, 49, okay. okay. And uh, see, I wasn't, if I were in the four year program, I would have graduated in 51. Right, okay. So this was 49. And in the same envelope where the draft notice was giving the date and time I was to report for induction at Fort Wayne in Detroit, that was the military fort. Uh, there was a letter also enclosed which postponed induction because of I had passed that exam and as long as I kept my grades up they would renew that postponement until I graduated. Super. And so then I thought okay so I'm going to be a private in the army as soon as I graduate. <laughs> and so then in January of 52, I'm due to graduate in June of 52. January 52, I see a notice on the bulletin board in civil engineering where the Air Force was looking for college grads with degrees in engineering or physics or chemistry. And I thought, that sounds better than being a private in the Army. So I applied. And I got called for an interview out to Selfridge Field, which is on Clemens, Michigan, if you're familiar with the mm -hmm. Detroit area. There's a big reserve, there was an uh, active duty Air Force wing out there, plus a reserve unit. And they called me out there for an interview, and I passed the interview. Then, oh, I'm ba back up. When I was at Wayne, uh, since I'd had high school ROTC, didn't have to take the freshman year if I wanted ROTC in college. So I signed up for ROTC in the sophomore year, finished the sophomore year. Before you could go into the junior year, you had to take a physical. I failed the eye exam, so I couldn't continue in ROTC. And so here I am trying to get into the Air Force. And the... Knowing about the eyes. <laughs> right, and I passed the, the written test, and it was like a personality type test or whatever. And then they said, okay, you, now you need to take a physical. And there was a group of us together, and I got separated from the other group. So I went in to take the eye exam, and the sergeant said, sit down, I'll be with you in a minute. I sat down, and there was the eye chart in front of me. And so I memorized the top two lines. 
And um, he came and says, take your glasses off. Okay, what can you read? I said, I can read down just the top two lines. Okay, what are they? I told him what they were. Cover that, we, eh, really don't. Okay, uh, they were good enough to get in. So passed the eye exam. Then I had an oral interview with a group of officers. And then in May of 52, they offered me a commission as a second lieutenant in the Air Force, Air Force Reserve. And I, oh, another long story. In 19, early 1950, one of my buddies at Wayne, who had been in, uh, in World War II in the Navy, and he was a petty officer, second or first class, and he was in the Naval Reserves. He said, come on, join the Naval Reserves. He said, it's a good deal. Two weeks in the summer, you go on a cruise, you get paid for it, you get paid for two drills. I enlisted in the Naval Reserves in early 1950. Well, you know what happened in the summer of 1950? The North Koreans moved into South Korea, and so, and we drilled once a week, and we'd go in each e for the drill, and there'd be a big blackboard, and there'd be a list of names on it, see the chief yeoman, and they were calling guys in individually back to active duty for the Korean War. I thought, this doesn't sound too good. I was supposed to go to the Naval Air Station, the Naval Training Station in Great Lakes for two weeks for basic boot camp as the first assignment. Well, it was so full there with enlistees and draftees that they didn't have any space for me. So I didn't get the two-week boot camp. So when school started in September, I told the yeoman, chief yeoman, I've got a conflict with my classes. I won't be able to come to drill. He says, no problem. Turn your uniforms in, and we'll put you on the inactive list. So that was in 1950. So in 1952, I want to get into the Air Force. I had to get, the Air Force said, well, okay, we need to get a conditional release from the Navy before we can give you a commission in the Air Force. So May of 52, I get sworn in as a second lieutenant. August of 52, I get called to active duty. But I graduated in June of 52. August 52, I go off to the Air Force. And I go down to Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. And I thought, okay. And, and the order said, subject to successfully passing physical exam at first duty station. Uh, well, okay, we'll see. So I get down there. They give us the check, of course, to buy our uniforms, bought the uniforms. And then they put us through physical exam. So I'm standing in line, all dressed in my new uniform. And uh, the, uh, the uh, medic takes my glasses, measures the prescription. I said, oh, they got me. And then they take me in to take the eye exam. And it's one of these, you know, they change it. Uh, and my eyesight was, I think, 2,200 or 2,400. I don't remember. Pretty bad but corrected to 2020. And so the, the medic said, well, he didn't pass the eye exam. You have to see the major. So I go in and see the major, and he looks at me, and he looks at me and says, says, Lieutenant, your eyes are pretty bad. He says, you know, you'll never fly. I said, Major, I don't intend to be a flyer. He <laughs> says, okay, signs a waiver for general duty. <laughs> so you got to stay in the Air Force. And it was interesting because here I am in the Air Force, and every once in a while I get this communication from the Navy. Now, what's this? So I was in the Naval Reserves and the Air Force at the same time <laughs> because somebody in the Air Force had forgotten to go back and tell the Navy that I'd gotten a commission in the Air Force and they should have then discharged me from the Navy. So in 1954, I get a real nice certificate from the Navy <laughs> saying I'd completed four years in the Navy. <laughs> But then, um, <coughs> so I was on active duty for a little over a year, and then in 1953, and I spent the whole time in the Air Training Command, uh, Officer's Basic Military School at Lackland for three months, 
nine months at Scott Air Force Base uh, learning to be a communications officer. And I just finished the nine month course and got my uh, duty assignment. They were going to send me to a uh, aircraft control and warning site in the hills of Pennsylvania, near Scranton, Pennsylvania, as a communications officer. But Eisenhower cut the size of the Air Force budget, and they had too many officers on active duty. And I was on a two-year active duty tour. The, the, the federal regulations at that time said if a reservist was called to active duty, once you're on active duty for 90 days, you could sign a form that said that the Air Force would have to release you at the end of two years. And I had signed that form. And so here I am, one year done, another year to go, and the Korean War was winding down, and Eisenhower cut the size of the Air Force budget. So they had too many officers. And so they came back and said, you can do several one things. You can withdraw that active duty statement and go back on an indefinite tour, or you can go back to the reserves. And here I am, a civil engineer, doing communications electronics work, which is not a good career path in the Air Force. Had I been a civil engineering officer in the Air Force, I might have stayed. But So I went back to the reserves. And I stayed in the reserves and the active reserves at Selfridge Field, uh, trained uh, one weekend a month, two weeks in summer, till 1960 when I left the Detroit area. And then stayed in the reserves till 63, and then the Air Force said either I had to be more active, resign my commission, or they'd take the commission from me, or I could retire if I was eligible. And I said, well, what do I have to be eligible to retire? He said, well, you had to be, I think, age 33 minimum and have at least a year of active duty. Well, I had the year of active duty, and I wasn't quite 33. So then I said, well, I'd like to retire. And they said, okay, we'll put your file in a suspense until you're 33. Age 33, i got to retire. Boy, you sure had all the luck. Don't, don't get any money from them, but. Uh, it's okay, but I got retired, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, that was, then I got off active duty in 53, came back to Detroit and got a job in a structural engineering firm. This was in 53, early 54. Uh, the economy went sour and I got laid off. Fortunately, the city of Detroit uh, Department of Public Works was hiring. They were. Uh, hiring engineers to start design work on the freeway system in Detroit because Eisen that was Eisenhower, yeah. He's the one that did the he, uh, interstate. was uh, building up the interstate. So I got hired uh, in the Highway and Expressway Bureau mm -hmm. and uh, designing freeways in Detroit. And I did that for two and a half or three years, I guess. And... Uh, and I moved to another consulting, moved to a consulting company for a short while, and then in 50, was it 57? Oh, meanwhile, I, uh, while I was working 48 hours a week, I decided I had some GI Bill, so I decided to go to law school at night. Did that for a year. Took a year of contract law and a year of tort law and decided it was not enough. and so I switched and to the master's degree program in civil engineering at Wayne State it was Wayne State then and uh, then in 57 um, the professor who headed up civil engineering at Wayne State called me and asked if I wanted to be an instructor so I said sure because I was already, you know, taking courses at night on you know, my master's degree, so I was a full-time instructor f uh, for two and a half years, and decided I liked teaching, and decided that if I was going to go into teaching, I had to get the, so to speak, union card, had to have a doctorate. So I quit teaching at Wayne State, 
went back to the city of Detroit full time so I could earn more money and uh, worked for them for a year and a summer and uh, then quit there and went to Northwestern full time as a doctoral student in 1960. Had a wife and two kids. Where'd Thir you meet your wife? At, at you Wayne University. Oh, okay. Well, she was a student there? She was a, a nursing student. Okay. Met her at Wesley Foundation. Okay. Good. And uh, got engaged before I went in the Air Force. About a year before I went in the Air Force. And then um, we got married in December 52. Well, I was on a 10-day leave, and uh, so we got married, and she was on on winter break, on Christmas break, so she came back down to Belleville, Illinois, and stayed for a week. I had to get up at 6, I, had to, I was going to school from 6 a.m. to 12 noon every day, Ooh. so I'd have to get up at like 4.30 or 5 o'clock, and uh, then... She stayed for a week, and then I sent her back to Detroit to back to school. And she stayed in school in to, and uh, in the nursing school, their their uh, terms were different than the standard uh, semesters. And when she finished that service that she was in at that point, she dropped out and came down to Belleville. And then uh, when I got out in '53, she picked up. She went back, we went back to Detroit, I went to work, and she went back to school. Okay. Uh, and she picked up the class that was following her class, and she eventually graduated. Oh, good. Did she get her RN? Yeah. Okay. Did she practice then? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> while I was in working full-time and going to law school part-time, uh, when she graduated, she took a job as a public health nurse working for the city of Detroit, you know, wearing the blue uniform and the silver badge mm -hmm. and the black bag uh, in the slums of Detroit. Mm, not easy. Uh, chasing down TB contacts, uh, working with uh, mothers with newborn babies, training them how to take care of their babies. And uh, <laughs> I remember one night she came on, she's doing this. And so we said, okay. So we we didn't have rugs on it. We just had a three, four rugs on the apartment. We took them off, put newspapers down. She had to strip, and then we. She had bed bugs, and the bed bugs had you know her uniform had a had a, a sleeve on it like this, and, and a, a belt, and wherever the belt was, there the tight sleeves, the bed bugs had chewed on her. Oh, <laughs> so. She says, well, now she remembers why in class they said when you go into these houses, do not sit on upholstered chairs <laughs> or couches. <laughs> sit on a wooden chair. <laughs> but, uh, so anyway, long stories. Then after, uh, after you got your, what, then before you came to Purdue? Yeah, I went to Northwestern. I got an automotive, automotive Safety Foundation fellowship for the first year. And then... Remember the National Defense Education Act? Oh, yeah. I got a National Defense Education Detail. Act fellowship, which right. was really good because right. it paid so much. Plus, really plus it paid so much per dependent. Sure. And, uh, and then also, when I got into the program, I got, uh, worked as a research assistant on my di on dissertation. And so, uh, like I always say, I started grad school, uh, PhD student, with two kids. By the time I finished, I had four kids. And uh, But I finished Northwestern. I've spent three years a grad student, and then they offered me an assistant professorship there, but I hadn't finished my dissertation, so they, the dean was smart. He kept his hand in my wallet. He said, well, I know you haven't finished, dissertation's still hanging on, but we'll appoint you as a lecturer. Three-quarter time, three-quarter pay and you finish your dissertation. So I worked three quarter time as an inst a lecturer teaching two courses a quarter and working three quarter time or full time on the dissertation and I finished it. And then I was an assistant professor for about a year and a half or so. 
and I could have stayed there, but it's not usually a good idea to stay where you got your doctorate. So I left there and went to University of Michigan. I was there for two years. That didn't work out too well. And uh, meanwhile, while I was there, the fellow who was then head of civil engineering at Wayne State came up and wanted to know if I'd come back because they were getting a master's program geared up, master and doctoral program in transportation. So stayed living in Ann Arbor and commuted to Detroit, taught at Wayne State then for two years till 1970, and then uh, came to Purdue. How did they, did they, uh, was there an opening or how did you did well, you touch base? Well, Ken them? Heddington was at, at uh, he was a PhD student at Northwestern uh, we overlapped just by a little bit. I think I, when I finished, when I was uh, teaching there, he was a doctoral student at Northwestern. And then when he finished, he came to Purdue. And so Purdue was looking for someone to uh, kind of specialize in teaching and to teach the undergraduate required course in transportation engineering, which all civil students had to take. It was a two lectures a week and a three-hour design lab. And, you know, all the civil students had to take it, so a required course. So it was offered both semesters and also during the summer. And it was a pretty heavy teaching load. And so I came down and interviewed and Harold Michael. Who's the head? He was head of, head of transportation. John McLaughlin was head of the civil oh, school. Oh, at that time, okay. And uh, I remember Harold took me to dinner out at Sarge Viltz. Remember Sarge Viltz? We uh, miss it. I really like yeah, it. Yeah, that was a good restaurant. Yeah, it sure was. And I interviewed, and they offered me a, a full-time position, and I accepted it because I was ready to move it to a bigger school. And uh, so that was 1970. I came to the campus, and I took over the CE 360, and I would... I'd do the lectures, and I would always do one of the design labs, and then I supervised the grad students who were on the other design labs. And I remember we always had a Saturday, 8.30 to 11.20 design lab. And just to show what a good guy I was, I took the Saturday class. <laughs> Not always, but frequently I'd do the Saturday Well, in that lab. case, you could still go to the games because they persistently would be around 1 o'clock or whatever, yeah. you know. Not well, like it is today. Well, when I first came, I had season tickets to the football just the first year I was here. And then I didn't have season tickets again until my oldest son was a student here. and He was in the band. So we had season tickets. Sure. And those are the only years I've had season sure. tickets to the football right. games. Where did you live when you came here? What was, did you get a, a house or an apartment? Yeah, no. Uh, we came to town in the spring of 70. You, excuse me, did you start in the fall then? Uh, July 1st. Oh, okay. In the so spring. you start teaching in the fall then. Right. I was on a 12-month appointment because mm -hmm. not only was I a, a associate professor of civil engineering, but I was also a research engineer with the John Highway Research Project. Oh, okay. So it was a 12-month appointment. So I started July 1st. And um, um, so my wife <laughs> came to town in the spring and went to a realtor and said we wanted to live in West Lafayette and you know how many houses they had available at that time to show me three houses that's all that was available in my price range right, and uh, still I looked at one on Linda Lane looked at one up on uh, Indian Trail then we looked at the uh, house that did remember Dr. Don McLeod he was a medical doctor at the uh, health service. Uh, name doesn't ring a bell. Of course, I know the health service, but I just... Um, he was selling his house, and so we looked at it, and it, it was big enough. It had two bedrooms in the basement and a full bathroom in the basement, and two bedrooms upstairs, and the third bedroom had been converted into an office. They'd taken the wall out because... Dr. McLeod's wife was a music teacher, piano teacher, and they had converted the third bedroom into a studio where she had a grand piano. Mm -hmm. And they could push the folding door back and then 
she could have recitals because they'd sit, put chairs up in the family room. But anyway, that was the only house that would fit us, so we bought it. We've been in that house for 40 years. Isn't that nice? It's uh, on the corner of Indian Trail and uh, Blackhawk. Oh, okay. Right, right on the corner. Good location and handy. Yeah, because Birchfield School was just two okay. short blocks away. And That's right. The uh, junior high was just a not too bad, and the high school not too bad a walk, so the kids could. Good. Well, they didn't have uh, school buses then. No, I understand. And the kids <laughs> kids walked to school. Well, we, I uh, went to grade school within walking distance, but high school was a little bit further, so my father had to drop me off, but we could take the bus home. You know, yeah. The bus. yeah. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about it at uh, your initial appointment, and you were teaching that, and um, one of the things that. Uh, it's kind of your key thing as a counselor to students, too. Uh, right. Uh, I didn't do much that initially. Uh, one of the assignments I had, I should mention, uh, when I first reported July 1st, Joint Highway Research Project had agreed with the cities of Lafayette and West Lafayette to make a study of public transit in the cities. Okay. Because that, prior, before, prior to my coming here, the uh, private bus company went out of business okay. and uh, the two cities came up with some money bought the assets of the private bus company which consists of about 15 or 20 ancient buses oh, they nice. were pre-world war ii buses and yeah, you were involved with that uh, and ken, ken heathington and bill greco and myself were assigned bill greco didn't have a very large part in it mainly Ken Hethington and myself, uh, supervised a group of grad students, and we did origin and destination survey, and we uh, did uh, counts on the buses and things that sort of made a complete study, because uh, one of my specialties is public transit, and made a complete study, and we de discovered a state law that allowed communities to um, establish a public transportation corporation. The law was originally written for Fort Wayne. And so we found this law, advised the two cities that they should, if they wanted to supply public uh, bus transit, they should set up a public transit corporation, which they did. And uh, appointed a board, and Ken Heathington was appointed to the board. And I continued working on it, and I wrote the first application for to the federal government so we could buy some buses. We bought 16 new buses. And uh, we also uh, put an application in to buy land and put up a, a terminal facility, which is there on Canal Road. And so we built the facility, had new buses. I say I wrote the uh, grant applications. And then Ken Heathington a year later decided to go to University of Tennessee. And so then uh, Mayor Williamson appointed me to the bus board, the uh, Greater Lafayette Public Transportation Corporation Board of Directors. And immediately I was appointed chairman of the board, and I was chairman of the board for eight years. And uh, I served on the board for 17 and a half years. And after well, that... Was chair was and before... And I was being chair, right? Well, and no, I was chair for eight years okay, to start and with, and then I stayed on afterwards for a total of 17 and a half years. And when I left the board, <laughs> I got John Fricker, who had been hired in uh, civil engineering transportation to take my place, and he's still on the board. <laughs> I think he's got more than 17 years now. I think he just passed my length of office. Um, so I was involved in uh, setting up the transit system and then running the transit system right. for a long time. It's really grown a lot, hasn't it? Oh, it has. Right. For years we tried to convince the Purdue University to uh, there were no subsidize. Buses on campus. There were no buses on campus. And then uh, and I the made sororities a got together and, and, and the fraternities for the... Um, the shuttle... Trucks. The, right, the uh, shuttle, right, and out of the, at the acres. Right, <clears throat> uh, and uh, also 
uh, the university uh, asked Joint Highway to make a study of the possibility of having a shuttle service <coughs> connecting Ross Aid Stadium parking lot to the campus by means of shuttle bus. So um, myself and oh, what's Bob's last name? Can't think good enough. Uh, the two of us did a, made a study. Would it have been Bob Miles? No, oh, okay. no. Okay. Um, That's all right. Go ahead. But anyway, yeah. the two of us made a study, submitted to Fred Ford, and showed that it was feasible to do this. Fred turned it down. And then when Fred left, uh, not too long after that, uh, there was an agreement worked out with the university and the GLPTC so that now it's really grown. And, uh, Quite a bit. Yes. Right. And, and it, it saved the university money because sure. they didn't have to put more parking structures up. And well, if you go up there at Ross Aid Stadium on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that lot's full. I can see it sometimes if I. Oh right, you, know, you live there I on live, Northwestern, right. yeah. And uh, buses circulate around. It's. Um, we were very fortunate when we hired Marty Sennett to be general manager. He's done an excellent job. Right. Now, did he come from the outside? Uh, yes, he. He, he wasn't with the university. No, he uh, got a degree in uh, public transit management from IU. George Smirk's program down there, and George and I worked together a number of years uh, giving short courses around the state on public transit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I knew George real well, and George had this program in the management school on public transit management. And down at IU? At IU. Okay. And uh, Marty Sennett's a graduate of that program. Yeah, he's been here quite a while. Oh, over 20 years probably. Mm -hmm. 20 maybe? Yeah, easily 20. Sure. He's done a good job. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the things you did in civil engineering. I'll let you share. Mm, some well, you counseling and uh, you used to run some of those traffic engineering. Used to run courses, right? Run okay. short courses twice a year. And I like for years. To teach and I like to see students learn. That's a great. Yeah, point. we would have uh, practicing engineers and uh, technicians from around the state, and we would uh, have these traffic engineering short courses. I did that for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Did you help out with the road? Oh, road sure. school, yeah, yeah. I used to give talks every so okay, often to right, the road okay. school. So there was some. It's part of the job. That's right, exactly. Yeah, and uh, it's uh, amazing. That's been going for just yeah. ever. Yeah. yeah. Long, long, long time. Well, it's set up by state statute. Oh, is that right? That oh, we okay. have to have a road school every year. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Harold Michael and uh, Bill Getz used to be co-chairmen for years and years and years and years. And then when Harold retired, Bill Getz retired, then Kumar Sinha took over. And, mm -hmm. and I think he's retired. He's not retired yet, but he no longer chairs that. Okay. But, you know, that's a big program. Um, so in my career, I tried to combine teaching, service, and research. And uh, I was never such a great researcher, I don't think, because I wasn't. You're involved in those. Invo which I is key. did a lot of service, a lot of teach. I used to teach two courses every semester. And then I got involved in, uh, I was the civil engineering representative to freshman engineering. So I would counsel the, and advise and supervise. I always would hire two civil engineering undergrads to work in freshman engineering as counselors, student counselors. Right. And then I would supervise them and then I would spend at least one afternoon a week in freshman engineering advising sure. the and students also, that are coming over to civil engineering. You also probably were involved with day on campus too, to some extent. Ah, uh, yes. When they come over there after the initial right. thing. Right, And so I was involved in that. And then uh, I would also do all of the, uh, when Mike Schurig was the undergraduate chief advisor in civil, I would do all of the uh, CODO evaluations as part of my responsibility so and then on the research uh, I would say I was an, an engineer research engineer with Joint Highway and so I would have students working on Joint Highway projects uh, but I don't have a long list of I think I have three PhD students I finished 
One of them was at Virginia Tech, and one still at Can University of Kansas. And the third one went back to Nigeria, I think, and I lost track of him. And then I must have had 15 or 20 master's students, and that's mm -hmm. some total. That sounds good. Okay. Let's talk. Um, school heads, let's see, John McLaughlin was the head when you came, and mm -hmm. then Harold, and then Dr. Yeah. Harold would have been, Harold came after John, didn't he? Yeah, and then uh, Vince Tranovich, I right. came, came in. Right, yeah. And when Mike Schurig retired, I moved down to the main office, and uh, I used to teach this one course. I had the uh, sophomore seminar every semester, and uh, in civil engineering, and then I would teach the uh, geometric design course. That's kind of one of my specialties, geometric design of highways. I used to teach that each spring, and but then as the enrollments increased, and I was the chief academic advisor, and I would buy, advise all of the freshmen coming in as sophomores, and I would advise all the sophomores until I selected an area of specialization, and then I'd assign them to a professor in that area. So I had a very heavy advising load yeah, for years, like, sure. and I was in the main office. And under Harold, I was called director of the undergraduate programs. Uh, under Drenovich, he didn't like that. So Drenovich never really knew what to call me. Yeah. Besides your first name. Yeah. <laughs> counselor at large. Yeah, I was <laughs> chief academic <laughs> undergraduate counselor, <laughs> okay. I guess. I read from many places. It's not the title. It's you know what you do. Right. <laughs> so and then I did that until I, until I retired. Right. And in then 99. you moved into an up. You moved into the city council. Can yeah. Talk a little about that. Yeah. Well. You were on a number of committees. Well, it was interesting because back when I was. And your um, quote is: "They involve some aspect of civil engineering, one way or another." That's pretty right. good. It's, I mean, they all do. Wastewater uh, treatment, police building committee. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Uh, back when I was on the uh, transit board, Sonia Marjoram and Lee Trackman came in one, at, one evening and asked if I'd run for city council. I said, no, I don't want to do that. I'll stay where I can, I think, make the most contribution, and that would be on the transit board. Well, that, and that <coughs> then after 17 years, I retired from that. I resigned from that. And then when I retired in 99, um, this was in May, and the Democrats didn't have anybody uh, that ran in the primary for District 4 at City Council. And so I talked with uh, Patty O'Callaghan of Long St. Church, I do. And I said, Patty, do they need someone to run the Democratic ticket for District 4? She said, yeah, that would be good. So I talked with Sonia, and Sonia said, yeah. So they slated me in, because I didn't go through the primary. They slated me in because they didn't have anybody. And so Sonia and I covered a lot of miles campaigning that summer, and I got elected uh, for the first term. And, and I was, she appointed me to the uh, Wastewater Utility Committee Pointed me to the uh, uh, sanitation, maybe or streets, yeah. or okay. And uh, several committees you were on. Public safety was another one. Yeah, yeah, and uh, then also she pointed me to the uh, traffic safety commission, and I was on the traffic safety commission for eight years. And uh, then after the four years, Sonia didn't run, and then Jan Mills ran. I wasn't going to run for a second term, and Jan Mills said, "Would you please run?" And so I did, and got elected. So we had still a majority of Democrats she, on the she council. She put you on the board. Then you moved. And the then, board then of I moved to works. the board of works. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's a that's a key committee. Yes. Right. Yeah, we'd meet every week, every right. Tuesday at. Well, a couple things. One was the uh, relocation of 231, and then the Lindbergh thing. Oh, Both the Lindbergh thing. Yeah. Watch. Yeah, the Lindbergh project. Uh, I'm sure people, you know, of course, a lot of the news things we pick up and we put in our vertical file. Yeah. Well, the Lindbergh that. project, uh, the hot consultant was hired to design it, and then that the, started in 
Sonia's. Yes. That's what I thought. Under Sonia's uh, term. Right. And um, it was designed, and there were a number of different alternatives that could have been used over the bog. We knew the bog was there. They did some borings, and they could tell sure. what was there. And 80% uh, of the cost was paid for by the federal government, federal funds coming through the state highway. And so we looked at the possibility of a bridge. We couldn't go around the bog because Purdue did not want their golf courses uh, disturbed. And so we had to go across the bog. And so there are a number, number of possibilities. One would be excavate all the bad material, put all fill in. In the bog? In the bog, mm -hmm. which, you know, they had put sheet piling down and excavate it, put in good sand gravel, compact it, so forth. Uh, or they could um, put surcharge on it. Surcharge meaning you take the material that's there and pile dirt on top. And the idea is that the extra weight of that dirt would compact the material underneath, force the water out of the pores, and compact the material. And then there's also a possibility of a bridge. Bridge was the most expensive alternative. Mm -hmm. State wouldn't go for that. The feds wouldn't go for it. They said, let's go with the compaction, the uh, surcharge method. So that's what they started. They put the surcharge on it, and what happened? Instead of just compacting material, the material flowed out to either side. And that didn't work. And so then they said, well, what do we do now? And so then Purdue's geotechnical engineering group got a couple of students, a couple of faculty involved, they looked at it, and they said, well, maybe what you could do is um, put uh, some piles down, geofabric, coarse aggregate, compact it down, and build your road. And then the contractor said, well, how about if we just put some of these piles along the side about every six feet where this material is slipping out. I told the mayor, that's not going to work. So they, the mayor said, no, don't do that. It's not going to work. So uh, meanwhile, the general contractor came across, oh, the, we got a, uh, a design and an estimate from a uh, contractor in the east who had a lot of experience with this type of material. The general contractor, meanwhile, found a contractor who was working on campus doing some work for Purdue. They're out of Kansas City. And the contractor in Kansas City said, I can do that. And I can do it cheaper than what the contractor from the East Coast would. And so the general contractor said, I want to use this subcontractor. And the state said, the city wanted to use the one from East. But the state said, you can't get between the general contractor and his subs. And so they said, the general contractor can use this sub. And the sub came in with a design. And the state accepted it. Well, then what happened was during, you know, they put the, they've got concrete piles down there that doesn't, don't have reinforcement, just concrete, um, every about six feet crossways and the length. I've forgotten how many of them. Hundreds of, of these piles in there. And then they proceeded to uh, put a geofabric in, which was not as strong as what was recommended by the contractor in the East. And they also, the general contractor wanted to use this soil material that they had used for the surcharge, and the state approved it. And so they put in this soil material which is not coarse aggregate. Coarse aggregate will lock. And the idea was this this coarse aggregate with the geofabric, uh, several layers of geofabric, would lock in and it would bridge between these piles. They didn't use the right geofabric. They didn't use the right soil material aggregate. And then they put it in, put the pavement over it, that goes like this. So 
wait for the next stage or the next drug or whatever. Huh? Well, now that's what they're planning to do is put a bridge in. So that's the relocation the 231, that, that's a city and county. Yeah, I really didn't get no, involved with that. That's still in, in the process. Yes. And it's going to take some, but it'll make a complete change within yes, around, right. around the university, I think is right. what they're really talking and about. And the plan is to, well, Lindbergh will inter have an uh, intersection with New 231. Um, Cumberland will. Cumberland's going to be extended out there. And then uh, State Road 25 will have an intersection. Right, right, okay. Hopefully and we're still around when that comes. Send me a card if not. <laughs> depends on how long I live. I'll be, I'll be 81 <laughs> in September. Um, were you ever a faculty fellow at any of the residents? No. Stuff? Okay. Um, words and honors. You got Sagamore, the Wabash, and... Got that because I was on nice. the governor's advisory committee on public transit. Uh, I was one of your associates, and American, you're also American Society of Civil Engineers. Let me ask you on the Sagamore. How did, did was it a surprise? Uh, well, it's I kind think of I asked people that. Yeah, it was kind of a surprise because uh, I was appointed to the Governor's Advisory Committee on Public Transit. Uh -huh. uh, George Smirk was on it, and I was on it, and a number of others. And we advised the <laughs> governor on uh, how to distribute the funds that were collected from the taxpayers to support public transit. And I was on that committee for four years, six years, I don't know how long it was. And at the end of the term, um, when I finished the, the uh, tenure in that position, and I think the advisory committee then disappeared. And a little while later, I get this mailer in the mail. I pull it out. And it's a sag more than Wabash. <laughs> so, no, I didn't know it was coming. After we're off, I'll tell you uh, another one. Um, but, and also, you got the Gilbert T. Saturday, Ross Judson. Book. Oh, that was for advising. Yeah, I got that nice. twice. Right. Any Ross. other awards? To no. Okay. Um, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? Or an outstanding event? Or both? I don't think so. Okay. Any, okay. I'll tell you one thing, though. Okay. My two oldest sons are yeah, both civil engineering family. grads. Okay. And You're from Purdue? They're both civil engineering grads, and they both specialized in transportation. They went to Purdue? Right. Good. Okay. And at one time, I looked out in my traffic engineering class, and both my sons were in my class because <laughs> there was just one division, and they wanted to take the traffic engineering course. So. I want to take it with Dad. <laughs> yeah. One got an A and one got a B. <laughs> Oh, and my it. second son uh, has a master's degree in, in civil engineering, especially in transportation. And he says he probably has the record for having his father for more as an instructor in more courses than anybody else. <laughs> because his specialty was what I was teaching. Right. So I taught, taught him the railroad engineering course, the highway safety grad course, traffic engineering course, the geometric design course, the advanced geometric design course, the, the uh, transportation planning course. <laughs> Very good. And he's still, he's doing, uh, he, work, he works, he works for HNTB in Indianapolis. He did the railroad relocation track work here in Lafayette. Oh, good. Well, that's and, nice. And uh, he worked for them for 25 years and then led them up just about a year ago. Has he found something else? He got a job with a larger consulting company, URS, and he's their track engineer. Oh, very good. He's still located in Indianapolis. Good. Goes to Chicago and uh, Decatur, Illinois, where their offices are. Oh, good. That's, yeah. Worked out for him. It's okay. Yeah, all and right. the oldest son uh, now designs airplanes for Airbus. Oh, okay. He worked for the Santa Fe Railroad after he graduated. They downsized their engineering, and so they laid him off. And so he went to work for Boeing, worked for Boeing for about 13 years, and then switched to Airbus about three years ago, four years ago. Very good. He's a lead engineer for Airbus. Youngest son uh, also graduated Purdue in AFTEC, and the aviation uh, mechanic uh, airframe, got his bachelor's degree. <laughs> the last of my kids that I suspect to do this he joined the Navy, and the Navy taught him to fly. 
and he served eight years in the Navy as a flyer. Now he's a pilot for Delta. He was with with Northwest and the yeah. Northwest and Delta sure. combined. So now he's Delta. He flies DC nines out of Detroit. And he lives up on Cumberland and Linda Lane in West Lafayette. <laughs> That's so our youngest grandson we see every so often. <laughs> right. And our daughter, Purdue, went to Purdue for three years in phys ed, switched to nursing, did a year in nursing here, and her boyfriend moved east. She followed him and uh, went to Mount St. Mary's College in Newburgh, New York, and finally got a nursing degree. Okay. So that's where they live in that area? Uh, well, she's since divorced that guy, oh. and uh, she remarried, and she lives in Pittsburgh. Oh, okay. Got her master's degree in uh, exercise uh, science, and works as a nurse uh, in um, the Dean Warnish program on uh, heart, uh, I forget what they call it, take people who are at risk for heart trouble and get them on proper diet and exercise. And she teaches yoga and things of this sort. Things to help them out, which yeah. is nice. Yeah. That's good. How about uh, the post post retirement? Anything, any comment on that? No. Just some trips, okay. <laughs> trips, um, yeah. spending time going to doctor's offices. <laughs> oh, I got, but you decided to got stay. Got that pacemaker and uh, then uh, in March, I had atrial fibrillation. March and of this year? Yeah. Oh, whoops. And uh, they put me on Coumadin, so I visit the Coumadin nurse every month now. And uh, then they gave me shock treatment to get my heart back in the sure. rhythm, and it seemed to work. Good. Okay. So I take special okay. medicine for that. Um, civil engineering in Trenton, take a look at any, I'll leave it to you in closing, anything I forgot to ask on oh. any sort of Engineering, in, civil engineering in general, I think they're trying to, you know, give the students more liberal arts, which is good, but they've decreased the amount of technical material from what I, when I was in school. Sure. Uh, like I had, I think, 143 semester hours when I graduated in civil engineering back in '52. Now I think they've got 100. And 28 or so, I'm not sure. Yeah, it, it's way down and sure. they're requiring more liberal arts and more systems engineering and more uh, uh, team mm -hmm. design type things and which and so they're getting less technical uh, which I think puts them at a disadvantage in a way uh, when they have their first job and anymore I think if a person is going to really do a good job in, in civil engineering anymore, they've got to get a master's degree. The bachelor's degree can become more general, you know, the, the writing and working in teams, which is good. Sure, and they right. need that. Uh, and more of the liberal arts, which is good, and basic sciences and a little bit of civil engineering. But then uh, they've got to specialize if they're going to the be useful level. in the master's level. Right. Yeah, and so they've been talking about that for years. That the first professional degree should be the master's degree in engineering, but it's just not gotten there. It may never. Uh, hard to say. Yeah, they you know they should, in my opinion, require the master's degree if, before you can take your PE license exam. Let me ask you on the PE, do a lot of, do many on an average go ahead with that or does it vary? I, in civil engineering we don't require but we highly encourage all the students to take their EIT exam and most all of them do. I, I forgot what percent was. Sure, okay. In the high 90 percent uh, uh, take the, P, the EIT exam which is the first step towards registration. Right. right. It's a good thing to have, even if you go, because yeah. you've always got that shingle to hang. Right. No matter what yeah. happens over I time. I never regret getting that. That's right. Yeah. I was a registered engineer in Michigan and Indiana. Yeah. Indiana was by reciprocity because I took the exams in Michigan. Sure. Okay. 
Anything? We think we covered everything. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We got a few minutes.